Section One of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. The Aeneid by Virgil, translated by J. W. McHale. Chapter One: The Coming of Aeneas to Carthage, Part One. I sing of arms, and the man who of old from the coasts of Troy came, an exile of fate, to Italy and the shore of Lavinium, hard driven on land and on the deep by the violence of heaven, for cruel Juno's unforgetful anger, and hard bestead in war also, ere he might found a city and carry his gods into Latium, from whom is the Latin race, the lords of Alba, and the stately city of Rome. Muse, tell me why, for what attaint of her deity, or in what vexation, did the Queen of Heaven drive one so excellent in goodness to circle through so many afflictions, to face so many toils? Is anger so fierce in celestial spirits? There was a city of ancient days that Tyrian settlers dwelt in, Carthage, over against Italy and the Tiber mouths afar, rich of store and mighty in war's fierce pursuits, wherein, they say, alone beyond all other lands had Juno her seat, and held Samos itself less dear. Here was her armour, here her chariot. Even now, if fate permit, the goddess strives to nurture it for queen of the nations. Nevertheless she had heard a race was issuing of the blood of Troy, which sometime should overthrow her Tyrian citadel. From it should come a people, lord of lands and tyrannous in war, the destroyer of Libya. So rolled the destinies. Fearful of that, the daughter of Saturn, the old war in her remembrance that she fought at Troy for her beloved Argos long ago, nor had the spirits of her anger nor the bitterness of her vexation yet gone out of mind, deep stored in her soul lies the judgment of Paris, the insult of her slighted beauty, the hated race and the dignities of ravished Ganymede, fired with this also, she tossed all over ocean the Trojan remnant left of the Greek host, and merciless Achilles, and held them afar from Latium. And many a year were they wandering, driven of fate around all the seas. Such work was it to found the Roman people. Hardly out of sight of the land of Sicily did they set their sails to sea, and merrily upturned the salt foam with brazen prow. When Juno, the undying wound still deep in her heart, thus broke out alone. Am I then to abandon my baffled purpose, powerless to keep the Teucrian king from Italy, and because fate forbids me? Could Pallas lay the Argive fleet in ashes, and sink the Argives in the sea, for one man's guilt, mad Orlean Ajax? Her hand darted Joe's flying fire from the clouds, scattered their ships, upturned the seas in tempest. Him, his pierced breast yet breathing forth the flame, she caught in a whirlwind and impaled on a spike of rock. But I, who move queen among immortals, I, sister and wife of Jove, wage warfare all these years with a single people, and is there any who still adores Juno's divinity, or will kneel to lay sacrifice on her altars? Such thoughts inly revolving in her kindled bosom, the goddess reaches Aeolia, the home of storm-clouds, the land laden with furious southern gales. Here, in a desolate cavern, Aeolus keeps under royal dominion and yokes in dungeon fetters the struggling winds and loud storms. They, with mighty moan, range indignant round their mountain barriers. In his lofty citadel Aeolus sits sceptred, assuages their temper and soothes their rage. Else would they carry with them seas and lands and the depth of heaven, and sweep them through space in their flying course. But, fearful of this, the Lord Omnipotent hath hidden them in a caverned gloom, and laid a mountain mass high over them, and appointed them a ruler, who should know by certain law to strain and slacken the reins at command. 
to him now juno spoke thus in suppliant accents aeolus for to thee hath the father of gods and king of men given the wind that lulls and that lifts the waves a people mine enemy sails the tyrene sea carrying into italy the conquered gods of their ilian home browse thy winds to fury and overwhelm their sinking vessels or dry them asunder and strew ocean with their bodies mine are twice severed nymphs of passing loveliness her who of them all is the most excellent in beauty diopea i will unite to thee in wedlock to be thine for ever that for this thy service she may fulfil all her years at thy side and make thee father of a beautiful race aeolus thus returned thy no queen the task to search whereto thou hast desire for me it is right to do thy bidding for thee have I this poor kingdom, from thee my sceptre and Jove's grace. Thou dost grant me to take my seat at the feast of the gods, and makest me sovereign over clouds and storms. Even with these words, turning his spear, he struck the side of the hollow hill, and the winds, as in banded array, pour where passage is given them, and cover earth with eddying blasts east wind and west wind together and the gusty southwester falling prone on the sea stir it up from its lowest chambers and roll vast billows to the shore behind rises shouting of men and whistling of cordage in a moment clouds blot sky and daylight from the teucrians eyes black night broods over the deep pole thunders to pole and the air quivers with incessant flashes all menaces them with instant death straightway aeneas's frame grows unnerved and chill and stretching either hand to heaven he cries thus aloud ah thrice and four times happy they who found their doom under high troy town before their fathers faces ah son of tydeus bravest of the grecian race that i could not have fallen on the ilian plains and gasped out this my life beneath thine hand where under the spear of eosides lies fierce hector lies marty sarpedon where simoas so often bore beneath his whirling wave shields and helmets and brave bodies of men as the cry leaves his lips a gust of the shrill north strikes full on the sail and raises the waves up to heaven the oars are snapped the prow swings away and gives her side to the waves down in a heap comes a broken mountain of water these hang on the wave's ridge to these the yawning billows shows ground amid the surge where the sea churns with sand three ships the south wind catches and hurls on hidden rocks rocks amid the waves which italians call the altars a vast reef banking the sea three the east forces from the deep into shallows and quicksands piteous to see dashes on shoals and girdles with a sand bank one wherein loyal orontes and his lycians rode before their lord's eye a vast sea descending strikes astern the helmsman is dashed away and rolled forward headlong her as she lies the billow sends spinning thrice round with it and engulfs in the swift whirl scattered swimmers appear in the vast eddy armour of men timbers and trojan treasure amid the water ere now the stout ship of ilioneus ere now a brave achates and she wherein abbas rode and she wherein aged aletes have yielded to the storm through the shaken fastenings of their sides they all draw in the deadly water, and their opening seams give way. Meanwhile Neptune discerned with astonishment the loud roaring of the vexed sea, the tempest let loose from prison, and the still water boiling up from its depths, and lifting his head calm above the waves, looked forth across the deep. He sees all ocean strewn with Aeneas' fleet, the Trojans overwhelmed by the waves and the ruining heaven, Juno's guile and wrath lay clear to her brother's eye, east wind and west he calls before him, and thereon speaks thus. Stand you then so sure in your confidence of birth? 
careless o oh, winds of my deity dare you confound sky and earth and raise so huge a coil you whom i ah, but better to still the aroused waves for a second sin you shall pay me another penalty speed your flight and say this to your king not to him but to me was allotted the stern trident of ocean empire his fastnesses on the monstrous rocks where thou and thine east wind dwell there let aeolus glory in his palace and reign over the barred prison of his winds thus he speaks and ere the words are done he soothes the swollen seas chases away the gathered clouds and restores the sunlight Chemothoe and Triton together push the ships strongly off the sharp reef. Himself he eases them with his trident, channels the vast quicksands, and assuages the sea, gliding on light wheels along the water. Even as when oft in a throng of people strife hath risen, and the base multitude rage in their minds, and now brands and stones are flying, madness lends arms then if perchance they catch sight of one reverend for goodness and service they are silent and stand by with attentive ear he with speech sways their temper and soothes their beasts even so hath fallen all the thunder of ocean when riding forward beneath a cloudless sky the lord of the sea wheels his courses and lets his gliding chariot fly with loosened rein the outworn Aeneidae hasten to run for the nearest shore, and turn to the coast of Libya. There lies a spot deep within, an island forms a harbour with outstretched sides, whereon all the waves break from the open sea, and part into the hollows of the bay. On this side and that, and twin crags, beneath whose crest the sheltered water lies wide and calm, above hangs a background of flickering forest and the dark shade of rustling groves beneath the seaward brow is a rock-hung cavern within it fresh springs and seats in the living stone a haunt of nymphs where tired ships need no fetters to hold nor anchor to fasten them with crooked bite here with seven sail gathered of all his company aeneas enters and disembarking on the land of their desire the Trojans gain the chosen beach, and set their feet dripping with brine upon the shore. At once Achates struck a spark with the flint, and caught the fire on leaves, and laying dry fuel round, kindled it into flame. Then, weary of fortune, they fetch out corn spoiled by the sea, and weapons of corn-dressing, and begin to parch over the fire, and bruise in stones the grain they had rescued meanwhile aeneas scales the crag and seeks the whole view wide over ocean if he may see aught of antheus storm-crossed with his phrygian galleys armed with capis and caicus armour high astern ship in sight is none three stags he espies staying on the shore behind whole herds follow and graze in long train across the valley stopping short he snatched up a bow and swift arrows the arms trusting Achates was carrying, and first the leaders, their stately heads high with branching antlers, then the common herd fall to his hand, as he drives them with his shafts in a broken crowd through the leafy woods. Nor stays he till seven great victims are stretched on the sod, fulfilling the number of his ships. Thence he seeks the harbour, and parts them among all his company. The casks of wine that good Acestes had filled on the Trinacrian beach, the hero's gift at their departure he thereafter shares, and calms with speech their sorrowing hearts. O oh, comrades, for not now nor aforetime are we ignorant of ill. O oh, tried by heavier fortune, unto this last likewise will God appoint an end. The fury of Scylla and the roaring recesses of her crags you have been anigh the rocks of the cyclops you have trodden recall your courage put dull fear away this too some time we shall haply remember with delight through chequered fortunes through many perilous ways we steer for latium where destiny points us a quiet home there the realm of troy may rise again unforbidden keep heart and endure till prosperous fortune come 
such words he utters and sick with deep distress he feigns hope on his face and keeps his anguish hidden deep in his breast the others set to the spoil they are to feast upon tear shine from ribs and lay bare the flesh some cut into pieces and pierce it still quivering with spits others plant cauldrons on the beach and feed them with flame then they repair their strength with food and lying along the grass take their fill of old wine and fat venison after hunger is driven from the banquet and the board cleared they talk with lingering regret of their lost companions swaying between hope and fear whether they may believe them yet alive or now in their last agony and deaf to mortal call most does good aeneas inly wail the loss now of the valiant orontes now of amicus the cruel doom of lycus of brave gaius and brave Coanthus. and now they ceased when from the height of air jupiter looked down on the whale-winged sea and outspread lands the shores and broad countries and looking stood on the cope of heaven and cast down his eyes on the realm of libya to him thus troubled at heart venus her bright eyes brimming with tears sorrowfully speaks o oh, thou who dost sway mortal and immortal things with eternal command and the terror of thy thunderbolt how can my aeneas have transgressed so grievously against thee how his trojans on whom after so many deaths outgone all the world is barred for italy's sake from them some time in the rolling years the romans were to arise indeed from them were to be rulers who renewing the blood of tosa should hold sea and land in universal lordship this thou didst promise why o oh father is thy decree reversed this was my solace for the wretched ruin of sunken troy doom balanced against doom now so many woes are spent and the same fortune still pursues them lord and king what limit dost thou set to their agony and tenor could elude the encircling achaeans could thread in safety the illyrian bays and in most realms of the liburnians could climb tim of a source whence through nine months pours the bursting tide amid dreary moans of the mountain and covers the fields with horse waters yet there did he set patavium town a dwelling place for his teucrians gave his name to a nation and hung up the armor of troy now settled in peace he rests and is in quiet we thy children we whom thou beckonest to the heights of heaven our fleet miserably cast away for a single enemy's anger are betrayed and severed far from the italian coasts is this the reward of goodness is it thus thou dost restore our throne smiling on her with that look which clears sky and storms the parent of men and gods lightly kissed his daughter's lips then answered thus spare thy fears Aetherian. thy people's destiny abides unshaken thine eyes shall see the city lavinium their promised home thou shalt exalt to the starry heaven thy noble aeneas nor is my decree reversed he thou lovest for i will speak since this care keeps torturing thee and will unroll further the secret records of fate shall wage a great war in italy and crush warrior nations he shall appoint his people a law and a city till the third summer see him reigning in latium and three winters camps pass over the conquered rutulians but the boy ascanius whose surname is now eulus eulus he was while the ilian state stood sovereign thirty great circles of rolling months shall he fulfil in government he shall carry the kingdom from its fastness in lavinium and make a strong fortress of alba the long here the full space of thrice an hundred years shall the kingdom endure under the race of hector's kin till the royal priestess ilia from mars embrace shall give birth to a twin progeny thence shall romulus gay in tawny hide of the she-wolf that nursed him 
take up their line, and name them Romans after his own name. I appoint to thee neither period nor boundary of empire. I have given them dominion without end. Nay, harsh Juno, who in her fear now troubles earth and sea and sky, shall change to better counsels, and with me shall cherish the lords of the world, the gowned race of Rome. Thus it is willed. A day will come in the lapse of cycles when the house of Assaracus shall lay Thea and famed Mycenae in bondage, and reign over conquered Argos. From the fair line of Troy a Caesar shall arise, who shall limit his empire with ocean, his glory with the firmament, Julius, inheritor of a great Ilius name. Him one day, thy care done, thou shalt welcome to heaven, loaded with eastern spoils, to him too shall vows be addressed. Then shall war cease, and the iron ages soften. Hor, Faith, and Vesta, Quirnius and Remus brothers again, shall deliver statutes. The dreadful steel-riveted gates of war shall be shut fast. On murderous weapons the inhuman fury, his hands bound behind him with an hundred fetters of brass, shall sit within, shrieking with terrible blood-stained lips. So speaking, he sends Maya's son down from above, that the land and towers of Carthage, the new town, may receive the Trojans with open welcome, lest Dido, ignorant of doom, might debar them her land. Flying through the depth of air on winged orage, the flight messenger alights on the Libyan coasts. At once he does his bidding, at once, for a god willed it, the Phoenicians allay their haughty temper, the queen above all takes to herself grace and compassion towards the Teucrians. End of section one.